As a boy during the Civil War, my father worked in a mining camp on Lake Superior. One autumn, he missed by five minutes a boat carrying a load of copper down lake. The boat sank in a storm. All hands were lost. Such is the slender thread by which I came to exist. spots. Name's Tinkham. Ralph Russell Tinkham. And I built lighthouses in my day. It was the copper boom that opened the last of the Great Lakes to large boats in 1855. But it was iron ore hauled back through the locks and canal at the Sioux that transformed America into an industrial giant. By the turn of the century, the rich hematite scooped out of the Mesabi open pit mines and delivered in an unending train of ore cars to docks around this harbor, had made Minnesota the nation's leading ore producer. Almost overnight, U.S. Steel became America's corporate boss, boasting the largest fleet of freighters sailing anywhere under the American flag. Duluth Superior Harbor could claim more tonnage than New York or London. All that in an eight-month shipping season. The iron ore boats that loaded here and at two harbors set one record after another as they traveled swiftly, even recklessly, across Lake Superior. For all too soon, it was icy November again on what became, according to some, the most dangerous piece of water in the world. The blinding snowstorm of November 28, 1905 damaged or sank nearly 30 big ships. A fierce northeast gale swept across the lake, driving the overmatched ore carriers onto the rocky coast of the North Shore. Three of them were smashed within a dozen miles of the mouth of the Split Rock River. Instead of improving the design of their underpowered and uninsured boats, the owners, men who routinely launched 500-foot freighters named after their friends, went to Washington and lobbied for more federal aids to navigation on the lakes. At the top of the list was a lighthouse and fog signal in the vicinity of Split Rock Point. It was a time when iron ore called the tune, and America danced. The first time I saw this spot was from the deck of the steamer America, heading up to Isle Royal. You could still smell the smoke from the great fire that burned over the North Shore that summer. I didn't know it then, but Split Rock would be my first big job. This was wilderness in 1909. The only way to get here was by water. All the materials for building the lighthouse station were hauled up this sheer cliff. It was risky just bringing a boat in to unload. Everything from the baking powder for the French cook's biscuits to the huge fog signal engines came up in a skip powered by a steam hoist and derrick. I won't tell you how we got the hoist up here. Dynamite had to be used to prepare foundations in the bare rock outcropping. My quarters were under the roof of the first barn. The steel girders of the tower were anchored in place when construction halted that first winter. We hiked out through the woods in a November snowstorm and 
caught a logging train to Duluth. Next summer, the station was finished. It stood equipped with the latest in lighthouse technology, air siren, twin gasoline compressors, reflecting and refracting lenses, pressurized oil vapor lamp. It was a marvel of self-sufficiency, as magical as light itself. Exactly 168 feet from the focus of the light to the mean water level of the lake. Exactly. The official range of a third order lens was 22 miles. But it was visible at Devil's Island off the south shore of the lake. Early fishermen identified the beam as far away as Grand Marais. And that is more than 60 miles from here. The lens and pedestal were imported from Paris, France, and assembled right here in the tower. That bivalve Fresnel lens literally floats on a bearing surface of liquid mercury, despite weighing nearly four tons. Hmm. Brass work could use a touch or two. On the eve of August 10th, 1910, the first keeper of the station, Pete Young, wound the clockwork mechanism that rotated the huge lens assembly. Then he lit the incandescent lamp, producing a white light so brilliant you couldn't look at it with the naked eye. For the first time, the beacon shone at unfailing intervals across the western end of Lake Superior. Keeper Young could sit in his rocking chair and tell by the flashes on the fog signal chimney 
if the light was on time. If it wasn't, he'd be up there in half a minute. Keeper Young's probably asking his assistant, Frank Koval, when he's going to get back to work. More than one man took up photography to pass the time up here. And Keeper's had trouble getting good help at such an isolated station. Well, the first two assistants drowned on their way to Beaver Bay to get the mail. Pete needn't worry about Koval, though. Frank took over when Pete retired in 1928, became a respected keeper himself. For 15 years. You ready? Okay. Everybody say Teddy Roosevelt for president. The keepers worked hard. They were on their own. And it was up to them to be on the job round the clock. Pipes froze. Engines failed. Storms broke up the boat dock and blew down sheds. They had to be able to fix anything. Above all, they had to keep the light and fog signal working. One spring, Keeper Koval discovered the light was running slow. Now, let's take a reading here, Mark. Keep it right on a 10-second rotation. Two chilly April nights in a row, he and an assistant turned it by hand on its smooth mercury bearings. A stopwatch helped maintain the vital 10-second flashes that identified the beacon to passing mariners. Finally, a Two Harbors druggist delivered the right prescription. A bottle containing eight pounds of mercury restored the beacon's normal rotation. Koval's superiors in Detroit didn't always appreciate his efforts. All he got was a letter demanding more proof for his unauthorized expenditure. Inspection visits by the lighthouse tender were exciting times for the families at Split Rock. Where's my uniform? Uh, I think it's up in your room. Where's my house? In the house. I'll find her. Its arrival meant fresh supplies and word from the outside world. the station once myself. I'm afraid we took a little delight in sneaking up on the keepers. Mrs. Koval. Very nice, very nice. What is that wonderful smell? Freshly baked bread, perhaps. 
Mrs. Colville. The way you sneak up on a person, you don't give them half a chance. No, no, Mrs. Colville, it doesn't matter. I brought something here for all of you. The portable library, Mr. Pitt. Poetry, Mother. <laughs> I could see your way ahead of me. I was reading from that just last night. By the shores of Gitche by the shining big sea water. It's right here in Longfellow's Song of Hiawatha. I'm very impressed. And uh, do you know the part, um, I beheld the westward, westward marches, marches of all the, the unknown, unknown crowded nations. nations. All, all the, the land, land was full of people, restless, struggling, toiling, striving. Over all, all the lakes, lakes and rivers rushed their great canoes of thunder. I worked on lots of lighthouses after that. Alaska, Hawaii. This country was growing up all over the place. It was the age of lighthouses. In the winter, stations like Split Rock closed. The keepers would leave on the last boat in December and return in April when the ice broke up on the lake. One day in 1924, dust began rising to the west. Droves of laborers, men and horses, were building the new highway from Duluth. A new era came with it. The last major obstacle to the highway along the North Shore was right here, Silver Creek Cliff. Automobiles could now tour all the way to Canada. A whole new industry was born, and curious visitors began dropping in on Keepers Young and Coval and their lighthouse. Slowly, the lighthouse turned away from the water. It became dependent upon the land. The last leaky rowboat was burned as surplus property. The assistant keeper became a truck driver. This tramway was built in 1916 to replace the hoist and derrick. It was abandoned in the early 1930s when the lighthouse service stopped delivering supplies by water. There'd be no more excitement over surprise inspections. Keeper Koval was soon spending almost as much time with tourists as he was with his now year-round lighthouse duties. Visiting hours were established, signs and barriers erected, and even summer guides were hired to handle the extraordinary traffic. In 1940, when the U.S. Coast Guard absorbed the lighthouse service, Split Rock had the reputation as the most visited lighthouse in the nation. I myself retired in 1946 after rising to chief engineer for the entire lighthouse service. At the same time, the usefulness of light stations everywhere was diminishing. Advances in shipboard technology and the decline of the very iron ore industry that built the lighthouse and northeastern Minnesota led to the final retirement of Split Rock Light in 1969. 
More than three billion tons of ore had been shipped down lake in less than a century. The steel sinews for two world wars and the greatest industrial power the world has ever known passed under this beacon. But the same communications revolution that made the light outmoded also hastened the passing of this older America. across the water like torpedoes. Well, weren't there any more shipwrecks, Mr. Tinkham? Not a one. Due to the dedication of the men who served here, of course. Not a single major marine disaster occurred in this vicinity in more than a half century of operation. Can I take a picture with your camera? You want to try it, huh? Yeah. Well, come here and learn something. You flip this up, and you look right through there and get your picture, and then you push that down. Mm. Got it? Hold this. There you go. Visitors continue to pilgrimage from far and wide to see the celebrated lighthouse overlooking America's great inland sea, Hiawatha's Gitchigumi. Gotcha, Mr. Tinkham. Where'd he go? Dark behind it rose the forest. Bright before it beat the water. Beat the clear and sunny water. Beat the shining big sea water. I beheld the westward marches. Over all the lakes and rivers rushed their great canoes of thunder. 